I'm the director of the Family of Jerusalem Institute, and it's my special pleasure to chair this evening for two reasons. One is that this is, I think, perhaps one of the first, if not the first, book presentation by a Polanski Academy postdoctoral fellow, and so we're very happy that this event is occurring altogether. The second is that I think the topic is fascinating and of great interest for us, and this is the topic of ineffability. Now, in return for my chairing this session, you have to put up with me for three minutes before I turn it over to the speaker. You know that God, in Exodus 3, says, uh, Moses asks him his name, and he says, eh, yeah, I'll share, eh, yeah, I will be whomsoever I will be. And it occurred to me that maybe God's problem is that he can't do any better. Not that he doesn't know that he knows his name, but maybe that in fact he just can't do any better because of the relationship, the tenuous relationship that any god must have to language, any, any, any personage. Now, how can the question that we are facing tonight is the question of how can we talk about what we can't talk about? And, that's, and, the, and the reason is that there, we feel, being embodied subjectivities, that there's some relationship that what we can talk about and what we can't talk about. We want to understand that relationship. How is it, you know, what is, how does what we can't talk about limit what we can't talk about? Or how does the fact that we think linguistically actually affect our whole experience of life? This is the problem of ineffability. It has a long history. And in this wonderful book, which I recommend that you read, Dr. Jonas explains both the history and gives us some possible solutions to this, but she's going to tell you what she's going to do. So without further ado, I'm going to present to you Dr. Sylvia Jonas, who is a Polanski Academy Fellow here at this institute, and she will address us on ineffability and its metaphysics, the unspeakable in art, religion, philosophy, and then Dr. Ola Solomyak, who is also a Polanski Academy Fellow and close to this subject, will respond, so please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, I suppose everyone can hear me well so far. Speak and if to not, the microphone. Just, I'll speak to the microphone. Yes. Um, OK, I'm going to start with um, a little thought experiment, a little, I'm going to invite you to imagine something to give you a feeling of what kind of ineffability it is that I'm I've been writing about in my book. So imagine yourself sitting at the Philharmonics and listening to the orchestra playing Gustav Mahler's Symphony No. 2, or any other piece of music you particularly like. Imagine yourself closing your eyes and focusing entirely on the musical experience, getting absorbed by what you hear, and eventually feeling deeply moved. This feeling can sometimes be so strong that we feel like the music is speaking to us, is communicating something to us. Or putting it differently, it feels like we understand or get to know something through the music. The state the musical experience has put us in feels so meaningful that the phenomenology of our experience starts resembling the phen phenomenology of states of knowledge. We might even express this by saying things like, the music spoke to me, or this piece really communicates something profound. However, if somebody asked us, so what did the music say exactly? We wouldn't know what to answer. We might perhaps be able to say something vague like, well, it made me feel very excited or very sad or very happy. But we would probably find it very difficult to say something more precise, even though our experience had a very precise, very unique and special character. There are two ways of explaining such a situation. Either we're simply imagining and the music isn't really communicating anything to us. But if that's the case, what explains our excitement and the feeling of meaningfulness? Or what is communicated through the piece of music is ineffable and cannot be put into words. And if that is the case, wouldn't we like to know what exactly this ineffable thing is that is revealed to us through the music. I don't think that we're imagining when we sense meaning in extraordinary musical experiences. I think that there is something profound going on in such moments 
something that cannot be grasped in words, but that nevertheless can move us deeply. So we need to find out how meaningful ineffable experiences can be explained. And this is what I do in my book. Now, before I go into the details of the philosophical arguments, I should mention that meaningful and effable experiences like the one I've just described obviously do not only occur in musical settings or in aesthetic settings more generally, even though art can often cause such experiences. Meaningful and effable experiences can also occur in religious contexts, for example, during prayer, or even in more ordinary contexts, for example, in the face of a stunningly beautiful landscape. But it doesn't stop there either. Meaningful and effable experiences can also be caused by certain philosophical ideas. For example, I remember the moment when I first understood um, the idea of idealism, namely that the entire world might somehow de be dependent on my mind or even be created by my mind. And I thought it was the most extraordinary idea, an idea that would explain so much about how the world looks like to me, namely as revolving entirely around me. And I remember thinking, idealism is obviously true. <laughs> However, once I started studying the idea more closely, I realized that there is actually no coherent way of formulating an idealist doctrine that doesn't run into all kinds of contradictions, most notably with what physics has to tell us about the world. And indeed, most philosophers today agree that idealism is wrong. But at the same time, Many feel that there is something that our incoherent formulations of idealism try to get at. Perhaps this something is in fact an illusion, or it is something ineffable. The concept of ineffability, even though it is so mysterious and intractable, has a long and very distinguished philosophical history. In fact, the conviction that there are aspects of reality that cannot be expressed in language, even though our minds can somehow grasp them, is as old as philosophy itself. Already in the ancient writings of Gorgias, we find an argument with a substantial ineffability thesis about some aspects of reality, as well as in several Taoist scriptures and in Plotinus' Aeneads. In medieval times, <coughs> the ineffability of God was a central theme in Maimonides' writings, and it also appears in several places in Aquinas' Summa Theologica, as well as in his famous prayer Creator in Fabulis. Also in modern, in early modern philosophy, uh, also early modern philosophers grappled with ineffability. Kant speaks of the world as a showplace of manifoldness, order, purposiveness, and beauty that can be grasped only in speechless but nonetheless eloquent astonishment. Schopenhauer speaks similarly of the will, the most fundamental ontological category or essence of the world. And also Nietzsche, Heidegger, Adorno, and of course Wittgenstein argue, each in their own way, that reality as a whole or some aspects of reality cannot be grasped in language. What becomes clear in these historical examples is that the kind of ineffability talked about is not a trivial matter. And I say this because the word ineffability comes from the Latin ineffabilis, which literally means nothing but unutterable. And there can, of course, be trivial reasons for something's being unutterable. For example, if somebody holds my mouth shut, I cannot utter anything. Or relatedly, if somebody asked me to utter an infinite sentence, I could not, I could not do that either, simply because I'm a finite being. However, the ineffability that philosophers like Plotinus and Schopenhauer talk about, the ineffability that forms the subject matter of this book is not a trivial matter. Rather, it points at something deep and absolute, at a question that cannot be answered easily. And this question is, how can we make metaphysical sense of meaningful and effable experiences? What underlies or causes them? In my book, I consider four general ways of making sense of such ineffable experiences, ways that are compatible with the views and general methodology of contemporary analytical philosophy. And each one of them revolves around a particular philosophical concept. The first concept I consider is the concept of ineffable objects, and the question I raise is whether ineffable experiences of the kind just described can perhaps be explained by the presence of an ineffable object. 
The second concept I examine is the concept of ineffable truths. And the question I raise here is whether ineffable experiences can perhaps be explained as us getting to know an ineffable truth. The third concept I consider is the concept of ineffable contents. And the question I raise is whether ineffable experiences perhaps consist in us receiving a piece of ineffable content. And the final concept I examine is the concept of ineffable knowledge. And the question I raise is whether ineffable experiences actually mm -hmm. consist in us receiving a piece of ineffable knowledge. It is this fourth option I end up endorsing, and I will shortly explain a bit more about what I think this ineffable knowledge comes down to. But before we will get to that, let me tell you why I think ineffability should not be explained in terms of ineffable objects, truths, or contents. Of course, I can only outline some of the most important aspects of the argument I develop in my book, but I hope that this will be enough to give you at least a rough idea what's happening in the book. And if you're interested in knowing more about it, I would invite you to read the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with ineffable objects. Why would we think that ineffable experiences have to do with ineffable objects in the first place? And why do I think that the concept of ineffable objects is in fact incoherent? One reason to think about ineffability as somehow related to the existence of ineffable objects is that many of the historical references to ineffability sound like that is just what they have in mind. Lao Tzu speaks of the ineffable Tao, Plotinus of the ineffable one, Schopenhauer about the ineffable will. And despite the, the different names these philosophers have picked for the thing they call ineffable, in context it becomes clear that they are signifying something very similar, namely something that we would describe in contemporary language as reality as a whole, or perhaps slightly more Hegelian, as the absolute. Now, if there is such a thing as the absolute, which is supposed to consist of everything there is, then in what sense could this absolute be said to be ineffable? The only way to make sense of this is to say that the object has an ineffable property. Ordinary qualitative properties, such as being red or being round, are definitely not ineffable. We can express them by calling things red or round. So if there is a property that is ineffable, it must be non-qualitative. And since we're talking about the absolute, which is by definition not dependent on anything else, the property accounting for its ineffability could also not be relational, because relational properties imply dependence. So what we must look for, then, is a non-qualitative, non-relational property that somehow uniquely identifies the absolute and that somehow accounts for its alleged ineffability. And the only available candidate for such a property out there are hexieties. Hexieties, coming from the Latin word hike, which means this, are sometimes also called thisnesses. And they are supposed to be those properties that account for an object's individuality. This is especially relevant in the absence of any other distinguishing features. If object A and object B are two distinct objects, even if A and B have exactly the same qualitative and relational properties, A's hexiety is the property responsible for the fact that A is identical to A and A is not identical to B. This definition entails that hexieties are non-qualitative properties and their non-qualitative nature accounts for the fact that they are usually considered ineffable. It is impossible to determinately refer to something that doesn't have qualities. Now, why should we believe in the existence of such things as hexieties? I will give you a classic example for a possible world in order to explain why some people have felt compelled to postulate the existence of hexieties. Let's assume that two objects are identical, if and only if, they share all of their properties. This principle, which is also sometimes known as uh, Leibniz's law, or as the principle of the identity of indiscernibles, is endorsed by pretty much everyone. And the reason for this is that we need the principle in order to decide when two objects are different and when they are identical. Ordinary objects, such as cats and tables, typically differ with regard to both qualitative and relational properties. 
They are made of different materials, have different colors and different shapes, and occupy different spatiotemporal regions. But now let's imagine a universe, or a possible world, that contains nothing but two exactly similar spheres, made from solid iron, each one with a diameter of one meter, each one two meters away from the other, each one with the same color, temperature, solidity, and so forth. In such a case, the two objects share not only all of their qualitative properties, but also all of their relational properties. So the two objects cannot be distinguished at all. Now, Leibniz's law tells us that two objects are identical if and only if they share all of their properties. But we know by stipulation that there are two spheres. And the way to solve this puzzle is to argue that each of the two spheres has a property called its anxiety, which uniquely identifies it and accounts for the fact that it is not identical to the other sphere. So it seems like we have a good reason to believe in hexieties. They help us preserve Leibniz's law in tricky scenarios like the scenario of the two spheres. And this in turn means that we have a good candidate for an ineffable property. However, on closer inspection, it seems unclear that hexieties actually provide a solution to the problem of individuation because of a well-hidden circularity in the, in the metaphysical order of things. Recall that hexieties are supposed to establish distinctness between otherwise indistinguishable individuals. Yet, if hexieties can only be instantiated by individuals, then in order for us to be able to claim that an object instantiates an hexiety, we already have to know that the object is an individual. We can only posit that objects have distinct hexieties on the assumption that these objects are distinct. But this means that hexieties don't add significant information to the picture of individuation. And if they don't add significant information, then it is unclear why we should believe in their existence at all, or in the existence of ineffable properties. So ineffable properties, and thus ineffable objects, don't look like suitable candidates for an explanation of the metaphysics underlying ineffable experiences. But what about ineffable truths? Maybe the reason a Mahler symphony feels meaningful is because it somehow communicates truths that cannot be put into words. Do we have any reason to believe in the existence of ineffable truths? Well, there have been attempts to argue for them, and the most famous arguments emerged from the debate about physicalism and non-physicalism. I will briefly sketch the argument and then say why I think it doesn't work. Physicalists hold that everything that can be said about the world can be said in physical terms, or putting it differently, that reality is made up of nothing but physical facts. Non-physicalists, on the other hand, object that there are certain things, for example the human mind, that cannot be reduced to physical facts alone. The mind, they argue, is something that goes over and above the physical. As a way to support the non-physicalist claim, in the 1980s, philosophers like Frank Jackson and Thomas Nagel came up with some thought experiments that have since become quite famous and that, that are discussed until today. One of these famous thought experiments is known as the Mary example. Imagine Mary, a neuroscientist, who is very learned and knows everything that contemporary physics can tell us about what is involved in human color perception. Specifically, she knows everything there is to know about wavelengths, retina receptors, um, etc. However, Mary has grown up in an entirely black and white environment. And what she learned about physics was learned through black and white books and black and white films only. In other words, Mary has never seen colors herself. The thought experiment then proceeds with an invitation to imagine Mary being released from her black and white environment and seeing the color red for the first time. Intuitively, even though Mary knows everything physics can tell us about color perception, she learns something new when she perceives the color red for the first time herself. Non-physicalists like Jackson and Nagel have argued on the basis of this thought experiment that physicalism must be false and that in addition to the physical facts, there are also truths about the subjective phenomenology 
of what it is like for me or for you to, per to perceive the world. And such truths have sometimes been called perspectival truths because they are supposed to accommodate the irreducibly subjective element involved in perceptual experiences. Now, once we understand this thought experiment, it is easy to see how it could be used to argue for the existence of ineffable truths. If there is a truth about every fact out there, then perspectival facts would be accommodated by perspectival truths, which would only be accessible from the subjective perspective of the person having the relevant experience, and therefore, they would be incommunicable to other people. On first sight, this seems to fit our experiences. We all know that we cannot communicate, for example, the taste of vanilla ice cream to someone who has never tasted vanilla ice cream himself. The only way to understand what vanilla ice cream tastes like is to taste it ourselves. And hence it makes sense to assume the existence of ineffable truths. However, as I argue in my book, this chain of reasoning is flawed. The mere existence of phenomenal experiences is not enough to assume the existence of truths that correspond to those experiences. And moreover, once we examine the concept of a perspectival truth more closely, we can see that it is ontologically incoherent. This is because perspectival truths, if they existed, would be made true by their corresponding perspectival facts. But that means that truths with the same content would be made true by different things, which is counterintuitive. Imagine me looking at a tree and forming a representation of the tree in my mind, and imagine further a bat perceiving the tree through its sonar technique and forming a representation of that tree in its mind. The perspectivalist is committed to saying that my representation and the bat's representation are made true by different facts, namely the perspectival facts obtaining for me and for the bat, respectively. This is a paradoxical result, given that there is a clear sense in which both my and the bat's representations are made true by one and the same objective fact, namely that there is a tree out there. Hence, thought experiments like the Mary example do not give us reason to believe in the existence of perspectival facts, and thus also not ineffable truths. But perhaps ineffability should really be explained in terms of ineffable contents, rather than in terms of ineffable objects or truths. Perhaps what explains the meaningfulness of a Mahler symphony is that it communicates ineffable contents to us. The central idea behind the notion of ineffable or non-conceptual content is that it is possible for someone to be in a mental state with content without possessing the concepts needed to express the content of that state. And there have indeed been attempts to argue for the existence of such non-conceptual contents. The most well-known of these is the fineness of grain argument, which has been employed both in ordinary perceptual and in aesthetic contexts. The key claim of fineness of grain arguments is that our recognitional capacities outstrip our conceptual capacities or putting it a bit simpler, that we can perceive more than we can express. The perceptual details we take in with our five senses are so rich that we could never have enough concepts to express all of those details. However, as has been argued by John McDowell, even though some perceptual details, for example, a particular shade of color, may not have a canonical name yet, there is always the possibility of picking it out demonstrably for example, by pointing at it and forming a new concept for that particular shade of color. What this shows is that even though we may not always have an expression for a detail of perception right away, the fact that we can point this particular detail out by means of a demonstrative gesture and then invent a name for it guarantees that all perceptual details are at least potentially expressible. It may seem like the discussion of the possibility of non-conceptual content in ordinary cases of perception is beside the point for a discussion of musical experiences or aesthetic experiences more generally. However, once we look at things more closely, the intuitive difference between ordinary and extraordinary perceptual contexts vanishes, given that both, both of them are, after all, perceptual contexts. 
Symphonies, paintings, sculptures may present us with an extraordinary arrangement of perceptual input, but we have good reason to believe that, whatever perceptual detail we would like to pick out conceptually, we actually can pick it out, either by means of a canonical term or by means of a demonstrative gesture. This will never be enough to replace the actual experience of the artwork, of course. <coughs> but blaming this impossibility on an insufficiency of our language is like blaming a protractor for not being able to draw square circles. Language is simply not the right medium to transport the phenomenal what it is likeness of perceptual experiences. This brings us to our last candidate for a metaphysics of ineffability, the category of ineffable knowledge. And as you may have guessed, it is this category that I think is most helpful in giving a coherent explanation of meaningful ineffable experiences. That there are different kinds of knowledge out there is a truism. Different areas of thought yield different kinds of knowledge, scientific knowledge, mathematical knowledge, historical knowledge, sociological knowledge, and so forth. What connects these different kinds of knowledge is that they are all examples of propositional knowledge, of knowledge that can be expressed in language. And this, in turn, means that it can be passed on from person to person in written or spoken form. However, besides the class of propositional knowledge, there is also a class of non-propositional knowledge, of knowledge that cannot be passed on from person to person. Examples of such ineffable knowledge are knowledge how, indexical knowledge, and phenomenal knowledge. In my book, I explain each one of these categories, consider the main arguments that have been mounted against their existence, and show why they don't hold. I'll start with knowledge how. Proponents of knowledge how argue that there is a fundamental epistemic difference between knowledge how and knowledge that, and that each one constitutes an independent epistemological category. The alleged difference is that knowledge that is propositional, meaning that it can be rendered in propositional form, whereas knowledge how is non-propositional or ineffable, meaning that it cannot be reduced to propositional form. Knowledge how is also sometimes described as an ability, a skill, a competence, or a capacity. Jason Stanley and Tim Williamson, two fierce opponents of knowledge how, present a reductive account of knowledge how, which is supposed to show that all knowledge how ascriptions can be reduced to knowledge that ascriptions, and which can be summarized as follows. For any proposition R that ascribes knowledge how to a person S, for example, a proposition like Sophie knows how to ride a bike. The following principle holds according to Stanley and Williamson. Proposition R is true if and only if, for some contextually relevant way W, which is a way for Sophie to ride a bike, there is a practical mode of presentation M such that Sophie knows under M that W is a way for her to ride a bike. Now, here we have what seems like a reformulation of a knowledge how ascription into a knowledge that ascription. And if it is indeed possible to reformulate knowledge how into knowledge that in this way, then perhaps knowledge how is not ineffable after all. Let's look at the principle a bit more closely. Clearly, the practical mode of presentation M is the most interesting part of this account. It is supposed to capture that which is peculiar about knowledge how. When we say Sophie knows how to ride a bike, we don't mean that Sophie has watched the Tour de France a hundred times or that she has read a book about how to ride a bike. What we mean is that she herself is able to ride a bike. And this ability is what Stanley and Williamson want to capture in the clause, there is a practical mode of presentation M under which Sophie knows how to ride a bike. What this account lacks, however, is a further elucidation of M which is taken as primitive. Yet given that M is precisely that aspect of knowledge how that resists expression, taking it as a primitive means failing to explain the crucial and most puzzling aspect of knowledge how. So the maximum we can achieve is a reformulation of knowledge how ascriptions into knowledge that ascriptions, where the essential characteristic of knowledge how is coded into a primitive M. This shows that knowledge how is simply not fully reducible to knowledge that, 
And I assume that this in <coughs> fact conforms to most people's intuitions about what it is to know how to do something. And hence, knowledge how is our first clear-cut case of ineffable knowledge. Let's now proceed to indexical knowledge. Indexical knowledge is the kind of knowledge involved when we use indexical or demonstrative concepts, concepts such as I, this, that, here, there, etc. What is special about indexical expressions is that they can have varying reference even though the linguistic expressions themselves remain the same. This is the reason why many philosophers believe that indexical expressions have two kinds of meaning. A linguistic meaning, which is sometimes called character, and a content. The former characterizes the linguistic function of the expression, for example, the self-referentiality of the term I, whereas the latter characterizes the actual content expressed in each context. Take, for example, the following two sentences uttered by Peter and Paul. Peter says, I am hungry. Paul says, I am hungry. Their linguistic meaning is the same. Both sentences ascribe the property of being hungry to the person uttering the sentence. Their content, however, is different because the first sentence says that Peter is hungry, whereas the second says that Paul is hungry. The difference in content becomes even more salient in a scenario where only, P where only Peter really is hungry, but Paul isn't. In such a case, only the first utterance expresses a truth whereas the second expresses a falsehood. Now, in order to determine the content of a sentence containing indexical expressions, we therefore need a context. Who is the speaker? At what time? In which location and possible world is the sentence uttered? Without such a context, we can understand the linguistic meaning of an indexical utterance, but we cannot determine its content. Given that the reference of indexical expressions is thus entirely context dependent, we can say that indexical expressions without context are empty terms. Now, indexical knowledge is the knowledge enabling us to use indexical terms correctly, and it is ineffable. This can be nicely illustrated with the following thought experiment by John Perry. An amnesiac, a person who's lost his memory, Rudolf Lingens is lost in the Stanford Library. He reads a number of things in the library, including a biography of himself and a detailed account of the library in which he is lost. He believes any Frigean descriptive thought you think might help him. He still won't know who he is and where he is, no matter how much knowledge he piles up, until that moment when he's ready to say, this place is Al 5, floor 6 of Main Library Stanford. I am Rudolf Lingens. The example shows that even the most complete, detailed, and objective descriptions of a situation or a person do not allow Lingens the essential inference that he is that person and that he is there. What Lingens is missing is a piece of non-propositional and therefore ineffable knowledge. This knowledge is best explained in terms of a self-ascription of properties. Once Lingens understands that he is Lingens, he ascribes the property of being Lingens to himself. This self-description cannot be reduced to a proposition, but is best understood as a self-representational subsystem within the overall cognitive economy, whose function is to transform incoming information into indexical knowledge. What is important to note is that this self-representation does not carry any additional information about the self. It is primitive and information-free, which explains why it is ineffable. Its distinctive role is to embody indexical knowledge, not by explicitly encoding the information, but rather by the way it integrates perception and action with the information already within the system. We can imagine this as a process whereby the self-representation in question functions inferentially like a name. Self is lost in the library, not someone else. And hence, indexical knowledge is our second clear-cut case of ineffable knowledge. The final example we will consider is phenomenal knowledge. Recall the example of Mary, the neuroscientist who grew up in a black and white environment and who learned something new when she first sees the color red. We've already seen that it is incoherent to say that Mary learns a new truth when she first sees the color red. However, it is not incoherent to say that she gains a new piece of knowledge. 
If this knowledge is taken to be non-propositional, and the best way to understand non-propositional phenomenal knowledge is in terms of the epistemological concept of acquaintance. Both Leibniz and Russell argue that there is a way in which we can become directly acquainted with and thereby aware of the world outside of us. Russell famously states that we shall say that we have acquaintance with anything of which we are directly aware, without the intermediary of any process of inference or any knowledge of truths. The concept of acquaintance has a strong intuitive appeal because it manages to explain the difference between the knowledge we gain, for example, when somebody tells us that vanilla ice cream tastes sweet, which is a description of vanilla <coughs> ice cream resulting in propositional knowledge, and when we taste that vanilla ice cream taste sweet ourselves, meaning when we get acquainted with vanilla ice cream, which results in phenomenal knowledge. The advantage of explaining phenomenal knowledge in terms of the concept of acquaintance is that it doesn't force us to posit a new class of objects or facts that would be difficult to square with our existing ontology and might lead us, as we saw earlier, into incoherence. Hence, phenomenal knowledge gained through acquaintance is our third clear-cut case of ineffable knowledge. Okay, so far I've made a case for three kinds of ineffable knowledge. Knowledge how, indexical knowledge, and phenomenal knowledge by acquaintance. How do we get from here to our prime example, a meaningful, ineffable experience? After all, the concept of ineffable knowledge provides a metaphysical underpinning for instances of ineffability, but it doesn't explain why some ineffable experiences strike us as particularly meaningful. In order to explain the aspect of meaningfulness, I now submit the following. Just like it is possible to get acquainted with the world surrounding us, meaning its objects and their properties, it is possible to get acquainted with oneself. And this self-acquaintance is what explains meaningful and effable experiences. In moments of such self-acquaintance, we gain ineff ineffable phenomenal knowledge of ourselves. The fact that this knowledge is phenomenal knowledge it explains why it is ineffable. The fact that the object of this knowledge is ourself explains why self-acquaintance feels both extraordinarily insightful and extraordinarily meaningful. <coughs> In my book, I develop, I develop this idea by putting forth the following five claims. First, the reference point of indexical self-descriptions of properties is a primitive entity which I call self. Second, it is possible to stand in an acquaintance relation with oneself. Third, self-acquaintance is phenomenal knowledge and is such ineffable. Four, the importance we attach to moments of self-acquaintance is due to the object we get acquainted with, namely ourself. And five, the metaphysics of meaningful ineffability is to be explained in terms of self-acquaintance. Now the final step from here onward, namely the step from ordinary instances of ineffable knowledge to extraordinary ones, is now only a small one. The central role of the self already became apparent in our discussion of indexical knowledge and knowledge how, and the epistemic force of direct contact with the world around us clearly emerged from the discussion of phenomenal knowledge. All we have to do now is to put these two together and we arrive at the notion of self-acquaintance. If we already know that there is such a thing as the self, and if we further know that we can get acquainted with a whole range of things, then the possibility of self-acquaintance suddenly seems very natural. My central claim is thus, that meaningful and effable experiences are caused by a shift in our perception. Through this shift, the focal point of all our phenomenal experiences, namely the self, becomes itself the object of acquaintance. The metaphysics of meaningful ineffability can thus be described as a combination of a distinct mode of experience, namely acquaintance, with a particular object, namely the self. There are, of course, many factors that influence how one interprets such an experience. Education, cultural background, religion, and so <coughs> forth. All of these will suggest particular concepts to my mind in which to frame the experience. To the extent that such factors differ from person to person and from context to context, the quality of our ineffable experiences and the way in which we describe them will differ as well. The concept of self-acquaintance alone cannot do justice to the uniqueness of every individual ineffable experience. 
So I'm far from claiming that the concept of self-acquaintance explains everything that needs explanation about meaningful ineffability. <coughs> but I do believe that it can serve as a common metaphysical ground and thus as a minimal metaphysics for meaningful ineffable experiences. If you agree with me and would like to know more about this, I recommend my book. And if you disagree with me, I also recommend my book. Thank you very much. <laughs>